Now Shirley has our scripture reading. It's on? Okay, I'm reading Matthew chapter 9, verses 4 through 7 from the Amplified Version of the Bible. And it says, But Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil and harbor malice in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven and the penalty remitted? Or say, Get up and walk. And in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins and remit the penalty, he then said to the paralyzed man, Get up, pick up your sleeping pad, and go to your own house. And he got up and went away to his own house. Happy Sabbath again, friends. Um, let's say a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, may these words be a blessing and a savor of life to all those who hear. And uh, we ask that uh, we are encouraged, strengthened, and uh, inspired to do your work. Uh, please help me speak the words that you've given me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer in action, Matthew 9, 4 to 7. Shirley just read that for us. And in that story, there's a, uh, a man who's a, a paralytic. And he, he is there with, uh, with his friends. And Jesus discerned something in this man. He discerned the desire, the prayer in his heart to be healed. And Jesus compassionately looked at him. And here's what Jesus said to this, this man. He said in verse 6 of Matthew 9, he said, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. That was a command given from Jesus himself to this paralytic man. And look at what this man did in verse 7. What does it say that the man did when he heard Jesus say this? He arose and departed to his house. So that means he stood up and he walked. You know, there's something uh, I love about what the Lord does. Um, often, when I come to uh, Sabbath school, I'll hear something in uh, Sabbath school that relates to uh, what I'm speaking about. And uh, our brother Kevin said something that uh, stood out to me towards the end of Sabbath school. Kevin said the phrase, act on it. Okay, he was talking in relation to um, praying and acting on it. And that's exactly what we're talking about today, is acting on our prayers. That's exactly what this man did here. This man was laying there paralyzed in that bed. And when Jesus spoke, he had the strength and faith to believe and act upon the command from God. And that is why he was able to arise and walk and go to his house. He believed and he cooperated with God harmoniously and that's when the action happened. God gave the command, the paralytic believed, and he stood up and he walked. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 1, Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah lived at a time when Jerusalem was broken down in ruins. There were bricks, blocks laying everywhere, rubble, dust, um, animals crawling throughout the broken down city of Jerusalem, people didn't live there anymore. And in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, Nehemiah came to the Lord, and he began to pray to the Lord. In Nehemiah 1, for those who are looking, it's after Ezra 
And uh, right before the book of Job, a little bit before Psalms, Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. This is a a heartfelt, um, very real prayer from Nehemiah. He recognized his own corruption, the corruption of the people around him, and the fact that uh, the condition of Jerusalem being broken down, uh, their scattering to the farthest parts of the earth, that was because of their own actions. But Nehemiah still had faith to go to the Lord and ask for his mercy. And there's something here uh, in verse 9 that I'd like you to notice. It says, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. That there is a promise from the Lord to his people that if they would return to him, he would gather them and bring them to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah grabbed a hold of this promise of God. Part This promise from God was the reason he was able to act later, as we're going to see. He took the word of God like that paralytic. Remember, the paralytic was laying there, and Jesus said to him, Arise. What did the paralytic do? He acted, he arose, and he walked, even went to his own home. With Nehemiah here, he he takes a hold of the promise of God that God would gather his people and bring them to Jerusalem. Okay, so Nehemiah's got this promise in mind. He's holding on to it. He's prayed. And then he continues to go about his daily work. He was the king's cupbearer. But he didn't forget his prayer in the midst of his daily life. He was paying attention to, to the answer to that prayer. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2. It says here in Nehemiah 2, it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I'd never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So Nehemiah's doing his job, and his heart is heavy because Jerusalem's broken down and his people are scattered. And the king notices, he says, Nehemiah, you're you're not as joyful as normal. What is on your heart? The rest of verse 2 says, so I became dreadfully afraid. He's like, "Uh uh-oh. The king sees I'm upset. I don't want to ruin the king's day. I might die. He said, and I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, 
What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. You see, Nehemiah, in the moment there, right when he's by the king, he sends up a prayer to the Lord. Even in the moment, in the midst of a conversation, he acts and he prays because um, he recognized there's a possibility that his prayer could begin to be answered here. Remember, Nehemiah is paying attention to cooperate with God to answer this prayer that the city would be rebuilt. So he sends up a prayer to God while talking with the king. And here's what he says in verse 5. I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Wow. What a great task Nehemiah has taken on. He's just the king's cupbearer. I mean, and then he goes, well, I will say he was very trusted to be the king's cupbearer, okay? So Nehemiah, he was a good character. He was trustworthy. Um, but, you know, he, he's working in the kingdom with the, uh, uh, the king here, and then he sees an opportunity to be a part of the answer to God's promise. And he has a big dream. And he says, I want to go and build, rebuild the city of my God and my people. And he requests so kindly to the king. He says, king, live forever. I'd like to go and rebuild the city, Jerusalem. So prayer in action is um, something I believe that, that God wants us to practice. Prayer in action means when we pray, do we just send our prayers up and, and forget about them and just kind of hope God answers? Or do we pay attention like, like Nehemiah and keep that prayer continually in our hearts day by day and looking for God's answer? Because God has his own timing. He, he, he wants to answer and he will answer, but it may not be exactly at the time you expect so in faith, endure, have perseverance like Nehemiah. Go about your daily work and pay attention for the pieces to the puzzle, the parts of the answer to the prayer that God is giving you. Nehemiah recognized that. He saw that there was an opportunity here for him to make a request to the king. He requested to the king, and he went to go build that city as an answer to the prayer he prayed. And you know, when you, can, when you grab a hold of the Lord's promises, it allows you to do things that people may never expect. The task of rebuilding a city and leading a group of people to do that is enormous. But in faith, Nehemiah saw God's call upon his life, and he said, I know God wants to rebuild this city. I want to be a part of it. Lord, I want to go to that city. And what did the king do? Verse 6. The king said to me, How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set a time. Imagine getting that answer from the king. He just says, How long is your journey going to be? So the, the king said yes. Um, I like this interaction because you see a certain level of trust between the king and um, Nehemiah too. The king, I'm sure he very much appreciated Nehemiah being a servant of God. The king, um, you know, he saw that, that Nehemiah was upset and he asked him, hey, what's going on? So the king was happy to grant his request. So Nehemiah... In verse 11, it says here, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one that my God had put in my heart to what to do at Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. So Nehemiah was the only one there. The animals were in their holes. They were sleeping. They were not out. No people there. It was just Nehemiah 
the Lord and the animal which Nehemiah rode in that city that night, looking over the city and being filled with the um, dreams and visions that God had for him to accomplish. And that's something I'd encourage you to do too, is in your prayers with the Lord, take some time, some quiet space. Go to a place where there's nobody, the woods, um, maybe an abandoned city like Nehemiah. Just a place where you can go and be in the quiet with the Lord and hear the answers to your prayers. So Nehemiah was a man of action. He acted on, on his prayer, and he cooperated with the Lord when he recognized the answer. So what I'd like to emphasize from the story of Nehemiah is that he took a promise of God, he grabbed a hold of it, and he cooperated with God in acting upon it, just like that paralytic man. So when Jesus made the command, arise, the man simply believed and cooperated and acted. When God commands something, the power has already been given to act and to do. Maybe there's some people here um, that have are, are struggling with different things in their lives, and you're, you're asking the Lord for victory. And you're saying, you know, why isn't the Lord giving me victory over this yet? Well, believe the Lord. He's already given you the power to have victory. Yes, brothers and sisters, it's that simple. The Lord has already given you the power. When he says so, when he says be heal healed, you're healed. I'm not just talking uh, physical things. I'm talking spiritual battles that you might be having, temptations, sins that you're struggling against. It is a true and sure thing that God wants you to have victory and be healed from your sins. All you have to do is believe because he's already given the word. He's put out the command for you to be healed. If you will grab a hold of his hand and believe, you can have that victory instantaneously. You can. Just believe and it's done. It is that simple, brothers and sisters. It really is. The problem arises when we doubt and don't hold on to Jesus' hand. But the victory is already won. It's there. You just have to grab a hold of his hand and keep holding. So prayer in action. Prayer in action. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Uh, sometimes we're not sure about our prayers. We pray to God and we're saying, well, does God want this for me? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. And, you know, that is a valid prayer, to ask God and ask for his guidance and his wisdom on something. I can promise you that God will give you guidance on what you're asking about. Um, there are also other prayers, though, that we can be sure that God will give us the answer that we're requesting. Sometimes we have requests, like Jesus in the garden. He said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass for me. Okay, if it's your will. And, you know, we need to be willing to accept if something isn't God's will for us. And Jesus gives us a great example in that type of patience um, to be 
submitting to God's will for us. But there are other prayers, brothers and sisters, that when you pray, you can have absolute assurance that God is going to give you what you're requesting. Absolute assurance. One of them, and I would say one of the most important, is mercy and forgiveness for sins. God has specific promises in Scripture. We have a mediator before the throne of the Father mediating for us that promises to give us mercy when we ask. Promises. So please never doubt that God is going to give you mercy and forgiveness for your sins. Always grab a hold of that promise. He will always forgive you. Ask and repent and it shall be granted to you without a doubt. Um, I know some people may struggle with if God has forgiven us for different things and I can assure you if you've asked and repented and believe you're forgiven. It's a dangerous thing to believe God won't forgive you too. That's playing God. You don't want to play God and think that the God who made you can't forgive you of the sin that he promised he would forgive you if you ask. Okay? So that is one promise that God will fulfill to you for sure. Act on it, believe on it, and you can know that you've been forgiven for your sins. Prayer in action. What are some other kinds of prayers that we know God can answer? Nehemiah is another example. He read in the scriptures that God would gather his people back to Jerusalem. If they repented, they asked for forgiveness, and they humbled themselves. And and don't miss that part. They did humble themselves before, before the Lord and asked for forgiveness. So Nehemiah grabbed a hold of that promise, and he acted upon it. Specific promises in God's scriptures and things about the future, we can, we can grab a hold of those promises and believe with absolute certainty. Okay? God gave out the requirements. He said, repent, humble yourselves, do this, and I will gather you. It's that simple. Um, there are other prayers, though, like with the paralytic, Those are situations where um, it's more of a God's will type of thing. Um, There aren't specific promises in Scripture that say you will always be healed. Um, So there we do need to be submissive to God's will. For whatever reason, people aren't always healed of things. I don't know God's reasons, but uh, I believe God always has our best interest in mind. Um, So... Take a hold of that promise. Matthew 7, 7, ask, and it will be given to you. So part of the prayer in action here is the simple act of faith and belief. You do have a part to play in your faith. God gives you the gift of faith, but it's up to you to use it, okay? Um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 now. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for for the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Let's go down here to verse 7. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. I want to touch here on Noah, one of the great uh, fathers of faith. The Lord uh, gave Noah a message that the earth was going to be destroyed. He says, I'm going to fill the earth with water, 
and wipe out everybody on it. And Noah's, I'm, I'm sure the prayer in his heart was, Lord, please, how can we be saved? Please save us. And God gave him an answer. He said, I want you to build an ark, fill it with your family, animals. Call everyone who wants to be in that ark. Just call everyone to come be in that ark. Anybody's welcome. Just call them and go and build the ark. So the, the answer to Noah's prayer of being saved was given, into him, given to him uh, in the form of saying, okay, Noah, you'd like to be saved? Go build an ark. <laughs> That's another big project. Like Nehemiah, who goes and rebuilds a city, Noah goes and builds a giant ark while preaching a message that people were making fun of him for. Same thing happened to Nehemiah, actually. Sanballat and um, Tobiah and a few other people, they were constantly uh, working against Nehemiah as he was rebuilding the city. They were working against him, sending false messengers, telling lies, wanting to make false alliances, trying to distract him from the work that God had appointed him to. But Nehemiah acted in faith, kept moving forward, and knew what God had called him to. Noah did the same thing. He persevered in building that ark. He continued to act. He continued to exert his strength of muscle, of mind, of bone, of uh, blood flowing through his body. He used it all to work with God in answer to the command that was an answer to his prayer. God wants you to take part in the answer to your prayers. Don't run ahead of God, but do what God tells you to do. Believe, and it shall be done to you. It says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, with respect, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, righteousness which is according to faith. Great father of faith. And then we know Abraham a little bit after that. Abraham was told by God, go, leave your people, leave your country, and go to a land that I've promised to you. I will make your descendants as many or as much as the sand of the sea. Abraham believed the promise. And you know what? He acted and he believed and he became a great father of faith. Leviticus 16. Uh, we're coming to a close now. Let's go to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. This is the uh, very important chapter for all of us, by the way. It's about the Day of Atonement in which we are living. Uh, it's a special day. Leviticus 16 is about a special day. Every year that would happen in ancient Israel where the high priest would go into the most holy place, he'd go in there, and he would begin the cleansing of the sanctuary. And the sanctuary would be cleansed, the people would be cleansed, and... Um, it was the day for the um, forgiveness, complete and total forgiveness and wiping out and cleansing of sin. So that's what Leviticus 16 is about. And there was something specific that the people did on that day, um, on the Day of Atonement. It's here in Leviticus 16. They did a, a number of things, but Leviticus 16, verse 31 is what I want to point out. Leviticus 16, 31. It says... It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. Leviticus 16.31 says, the Day of Atonement was a day to afflict your souls. Afflicting your soul means praying to the Lord, humbling yourself. It actually means bowing in even sackcloth and um, really reflecting upon one's life. That's what it means to afflict your souls, feeling the weight of the sins that you've committed and being truly sorry and repentant and crying before the Lord, um, begging before the Lord, reviewing your life, 
to make sure that you've asked for forgiveness for all the things, to ask for forgiveness and victory, and to be able to let go of the chains that the, the devil had uh, bound you in. That's what the Day of Atonement was about in ancient Israel. It was about a special day of consecration, solemnity, and seriousness and soberness. Brothers and sisters, you know we are living in the Day of Atonement um, prophetically. We're living in a time when God is asking us to pay attention, be sober, be vigilant. Our, our enemies going about seeking to devour us. And on the Day of Atonement, one of the commands given by God was to afflict your souls. To have victory in the Day of Atonement, one of God's commands was to afflict your souls. You realize that? So, I, I really believe we should enjoy our lives while we're here now, but we should also not forget the seriousness with, in the day of which we're living now. We're approaching the end of time, brothers and sisters, and if we want to be with our Lord in heaven, if we want to have victory amidst the perils and the snares of the devil in these last days, God is calling us to afflict our souls. Maybe you're asking for victory over certain sins in your life, or you're asking for guidance and for answers. Well, living in the Day of Atonement, my question is, have you afflicted your soul before the Lord lately? Have you afflicted your soul before the Lord? Have you got down on your knees and begged Him? Have you sought Him diligently in the Day of Atonement? You may get your answer and your victory in that moment of affliction. So part of acting on God's command there, you know, we want to be free from the devil's chains that he has us in. God has commanded us today in the Day of Atonement to afflict our souls. We don't have to live in sadness and gloom, but we should live with, with seriousness and, and just know the time with which we're living, in which we're living. And uh, prayer in action there is simply taking the time and setting it aside and going and afflicting our souls. So we've looked at a few people today. We've looked at Nehemiah, the paralytic, Abraham, Noah, um, the group of people on the Day of Atonement, and we've seen that each of them in these stories, they took promises of God and they acted upon them. They believed what God said and they went for it. There's something uh, I believe that we want in this church right here. And that is to see a great harvest of souls from the community, from the Pittsburgh area, the Sanford area, and Siler City, surrounding areas. I believe we want to see that. And that is a promise I know God wants to fulfill, is to save souls and bring them into his kingdom. Do you believe that God wants to bring souls into his kingdom? Is that... Is that something you believe? Yeah. Amen. So let's act in faith and work towards making that happen. If that is something we want, we need to be attentive to the answers that the Lord is giving if that's something we want. Like Nehemiah, he prayed, and while he was going about his daily work, the king goes, hey, Nehemiah, what's going on? And he says, well, you know, I, uh, I'm feeling really bad. The city's broken down. And then he thinks, okay, I can make a request to God about this and then request the king, and maybe the prayer will be answered right now. So Nehemiah remembered it, and he went about it in his daily life. So um, for us, if we're wanting to bring people into the truth, let's pay attention day by day for the people that God puts in our path that are seeking truth. There are people out in this world who are going to get caught in the devil's snare in the last days if we don't warn them. Pay attention for people who are looking for a way out, who want the truth. Um, we want our evangelistic meetings to be successful in October. Um, a few weeks ago, I requested and we committed to praying together to make that happen. Um, and I would encourage you to keep praying about that. Do your part like Nehemiah and act upon making that happen. And part of the action may just be praying right now, but 
you know, make the point of giving out tracts, uh, inviting friends to church, getting involved with some Bible studies with people so that we can make these meetings in October successful. And not only is reaching out and sharing our faith important and acting upon it, but it's important to act on the prayers you're praying in your personal life, too. I know we all have things we're requesting of God. Let's pay attention for the answers and uh, take a hold of the help and advice and tools and materials that God makes available to make those prayers answered. Um, in the paralytics case, it was a simple, direct word from the Lord. He said, take up your bed and walk. That's simple. If you want victory over a sin, ask for victory, believe Jesus gives you victory, and take it. It's that simple. There may be other prayers. You're waiting for an answer in someone else's life. Well, pay attention for the answer in their life and see how you can be a part of that answer in their life. You have a prayer that you keep praying day by day. You pray about it every day. You ask God for an answer to this prayer. I have a question for you. How are you cooperating with God to answer that prayer? How are you cooperating with God to have that prayer be answered? How? What are you doing? What are you taking a hold of to have that prayer be answered? Not stepping ahead of God, but paying attention for what's available and with his promises. What are you doing to cooperate and work in harmony with God and the holy angels to answer that prayer. And as, as those prayers get answered, when you grab a hold of that victory, you're going to build momentum. You're going to see small prayers answered. You're going to see more and more pr prayers answered, and your faith is going to get stronger and stronger, and you're going to be noticing the answers to your prayers left, right, in front, behind, everywhere, because you'll have that spiritual eyesight to see the answers and cooperate with God. Is that something you want today, to build momentum in hearing your prayers answered, seeing the answers, and having victories with the Lord? Do you want to be a person of action and cooperate with God? Is that what you want today? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I'd like to ask that you give us the strength, the willingness.